Hi everyone and welcome to a new episode of the Fandom Science Podcast. My guest today is Dr. Mark Williams, who is a professor in the University of Utah and the author of the book, The Best, How Elite Athletes Are Made. In this book, Dr. Williams talks about a variety of factors that shape elite athletes and influence their development. So some of those influences that we talked about today are the role of the environment and where the athlete is born and how that affects their chances of becoming elite, the importance of unorganized sports like street soccer or street basketball, road hockey, etc. on the development of athletes, early specialization and whether it's harmful or beneficial, and much, much more. I hope you all enjoy this episode, and if you do, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast for the best sports science content. Well, thanks a lot for taking the time uh, to chat, Dr. Williams. I've been really enjoying your audiobook on my snowy walks here in Canada. Um, the The cold is brutal, but the book makes it easier. Uh, so I was really excited to kind of get to talk to you on the podcast and chat more about the book. Um, my pleasure. Many thanks for inviting me onto your podcast. And I'm glad that you're enjoying the book on your yeah. cold walks. <laughs> So what what made you decide to write this book? Like, where did the idea come from? Because a lot of researchers uh, do work in this area for years and never really, you know, are interested in putting it in a in a book for the public. So what made you do it? Hmm. Well, I guess I've been uh, doing research in this area for around thirty odd years now, and um, I've obviously published a fair few traditional scientific articles and a fair amount of work for coaches and um, and a number of previous books. But they've mostly been focused towards um, an academic audience. And I guess over the last decade or so, there's been um, a fair number of popular science books that have been published, um, you know, ranging from Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers uh, more than a decade ago, right the way through to other books like Matthew Saeed's Bounce, David Epstein's book, on sporting genes and range. And um, to some degree, I felt that the kind of work that I've been doing um, should be of interest to a wider audience. And I was keen to write a book that was true to the science in that regard, in that I think that arguably a contention with a lot of previous um, popular science books is that they tend to dramatize the science or rather to, to polarize it a little bit in the sense of conveying key issues in a very sort of black and white type of manner. But uh, the reality of it, of course, is that science is invariably much grayer than that. And um, I wanted to convey to a wider audience some of the nuances that exist in the scientific literature in and around these areas associated with the development of expertise. Yeah, I think uh, science a lot of times, most of the times, it's not really uh, that sexy. And so like when you want to market it to the public, a lot of times uh, what authors do is that they exaggerate things and they make it more black or white just to appeal more to to the public. And um, oftentimes that comes at the expense of the truth um, of what the science Mm -hmm. says. But my favorite part about your book is that you mix between... Uh, like empirical evidence, you talk about the research shows, but you also use anecdotes to 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 kind of like make the story more understandable and make the re- make the research more understandable. And so, I think that's kind of what separates uh, your book from from a lot in this uh, field. Mm. Uh, well, thank you for that comment. I mean, I guess I we would owe a lot of that to my co-author Tim Wigmore, who is a journalist for the Daily Telegraph in the UK. And, um, you know, I've, I've written a lot of material previously for other academics, practitioners, coaches, but we wanted to try and write something that would appeal even to people outside these trade areas, if you like, you know, parents, kids mm-hmm. interested in sport. And um, Tim managed to get access to a lot of elite level athletes and coaches and there are maybe around a hundred different elite athletes and coaches that have contributed to the book 
And um, we developed a, a nice method, ultimately, of, of writing the book in the sense that for each chapter, I would usually write sort of maybe four or 5,000 words of notes based on the science. And then uh, Tim would try and interview people who could talk around some of these topics in a, in a sort of a, a biographical manner. And then um, he'd try and mold the interviews around the science, and then we'd go back and forth on it. Um, and clearly, you know, I also contributed to the writing in many ways, and uh, Tim also contributed to the science because Tim was quite diligent, actually, in, in researching the literature having conversations with other academics as well. And he would often come back to me with science and say, uh, you know, how about including some of this? And there might be occasionally a paper that I'd not read myself. So I think it was a nice collaborative effort where hopefully we managed to bring together uh, a journalistic style to the book so that it can appeal to the wider audience, whilst at the same time covering a broad range of science and not dramatizing or presenting that science in a in a sort of a polarized manner. So the book is called The Best, How Elite Athletes Are Made, and it's split into three parts. Uh, the first part is on nature, serendipity, and the role of chance in making champions. The second is called Inside the Minds of Champions, and the third is Training Smarter and the Science of Success. So let's start with this. In the, in the part one of the book, you discuss how the environment of the athlete, uh, the environment that the athlete grows up in, impacts their likelihood of becoming elite. Um, what's the importance of where you are born on becoming an elite athlete, and what are the environmental characteristics that help athletes um, develop? Hmm. Yeah, I suppose our aim with this particular section was to readdress the balance a little bit. Uh, in the sense of, you know, this constant argument that's going on between nature and nurture, uh, whilst not dismissing the fact that genes likely do play a key role in performance, at the same time, uh, our chances of becoming an elite athlete are heavily influenced by the environment that we are brought up in. And to that regard, often as children, we don't have control over that issue, which highlights this notion that there's a fair bit of luck and serendipity involved in becoming an elite athlete. And, of course, one of those issues relates to the question of where you're born um, in the sense of, um, you know, whether you're born in an environment where uh, that particular sport is encouraged, where there is appropriate access to uh, other children, uh, both to play with and against, to provide a suitable stimulus and level of activity. And, of course, that there are appropriate training facilities, access to the right quality coaches at each stage of development. And, um, you know, if you look across the globe, you'll see that uh, experts across different sports do tend to emerge in clusters. I mean, uh, I currently live, as I said to you before we started the podcast, in the ski town of Park City in Utah. And, and um, you know, there's a high proportion of Olympic athletes who come from Park City because clearly it's the environment is very conducive towards ski skiing, you know, and 75% um, of Olympic skiers are born within an hour of a major ski resort. So clearly if you're born in, uh, in London or, or some rural part, flat part of the country with no mountains and no snow, it's very, very difficult to become an elite skier. And again, if you look at sort of, for instance, a lot of professional soccer players have historically come from in a city environments where, uh, you know, there is the right exposure to the sport uh, and access to uh, other players to play with. Uh, and it's a very competitive environment. So, so certainly where we're born, and I guess within that, potentially the notion of the size of the town, although I must qualify the fact that it's not the size of the town itself that is important per se. It's rather a proxy for the availability of some of these issues around you know, other, other athletes to play and compete with, uh, access to appropriate coaching and sports facilities, and in some instances, the physical geography that allows you to be able to participate in that sport. So 
I did my master's on the effect of population size on making it to the NHL. Um, mm-hmm. And w- what we found is kind of what we expected is that population size itself isn't really that determining of a factor as much as it is a proxy for what is happening in that town. Um, mm. But that had me wondering, in, in Canada, it's very common for families to move locations altogether uh, mm. just to give their children the best chance at becoming NHL players or at least go to college and get a scholarship playing in the NCAA. Um, yeah. When people move from one town to another just for their children and, and to develop their their hockey abilities um aside from the quality of the program what should they be looking for in the environment they're moving to like what environment would be conducive for their for their uh for their children hmm. i mean there's lots of broad issues around considering that move isn't there i mean you know not least i guess the employability opportunities for the parents and and the standard of living and things of that particular issue. But, um, I mean, ultimately, you know, in instances where kids move, um, and I come back to some examples I'm thinking about here in terms of the Premier League, for instance, where it used to be the case, I think they've changed the rule recently, that uh, you had to live within an hour, an hour and a half of the academy uh, in order to be able to, to enter the academy environment. So that would often result in clubs finding ways around that constraint. Like, for instance, a club like Manchester City or Manchester United might fly in kids from from Belfast, for instance, because it's arguably it's less than an hour's travel time if you if you fly. Or, of course, uh, parents would either relocate to the city or the club would look after the children in that environment. I mean, clearly, the welfare of the child. Um, the stability of the family structure are all very important issues. But from a high performance perspective, I mean, clearly the things that I mentioned earlier on are the factors that are important in the sense of is the athlete going to get exposure to exposure to the right quality of coaching? Uh, are there the appropriate training facilities and access to high level competition that is needed at each stage of development? And, uh, you know, is that seen as a community of excellence that would promote and encourage learning in those children? Yeah. Yeah, it's a risky move, not not only for the the parents' employment opportunities, but also for the kids' employment opportunity. Because assuming that if you move, you know, across the country for your kids' um, chances of making the NHL, like, the kids' chances are already at 0.01% probably. So it's not like it's not like you're 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 playing with good odds anyway for the for the family mm. or for the for the kid, but it's very common in here. And um yeah, yeah, that had me wondering. Yeah, I mean, um yes, I mean clearly there's a very small proportion of athletes who really reach the elite level across different sports. I mean, the ones I've heard most in the UK, for instance, have typically been reported in the newspapers where uh, the families are, are often given some sort of financial inducement to encourage the child to move closer to the club mm-hmm. from a training perspective, which I guess takes away some of the stress around employability and general day-to-day living issues. But again, there are very, very few kids that um, are at that level and that demonstrate that level of potential for the clubs to make that kind of investment. And often, of course, the risk financially does bear down on the family um, and the children that make the move. So it's so it's very, very difficult. Um, and, of course, you can see that in other sports like skiing as well. You know, as I said, it's seasonal in the first instance, which limits you to four to six months a year of skiing, unless you're, you come from... A family or have other sources of financial support that allows you to travel around the world to follow the snow. Uh, but clearly, if you live more than an hour away from the ski slope, then it becomes increasingly difficult to get the hours of practice and the exposure to the environment that um, that mm-hmm. you really need to progress in those types of sports. Well, one of the other things you mentioned in the book uh, within the same part is informal play so you know street soccer or street football futsal uh, 
um, mm -hmm. street basketball, road hockey, you know, that kind of play. Sometimes it's called backyard play, sometimes it's called, you know, street sports. Yep. Um, why is that so important for talent development? Well, certainly in the work that we've done in soccer, I mean, what we find is that those who progress to professional status have accumulated significantly more hours in um, non-coach-led practice activity, uh, street soccer, backyard soccer, beach soccer, whatever you want to call it. And um, an argument might be in the fact that kids tend to recreate situations that they see uh, on the television and in match play scenarios. You know, So they create realistic practice opportunities. And um, also this is done within a framework where Learning is very much based on discovery learning and it's very implicit in nature. So, you know, there's no coach to give specific instruction. There's no coach to organize blocked repetitive type practice sessions and there's no coach to give feedback. So it's a very dynamic learning environment. And of course, a lot of these uh, backyard uh, sport opportunities are also occur between siblings. So it's, it's, often common for the kids to be playing against older siblings, which presents a physical challenge that they have to, um, uh, you know, make the necessary adaptations, perhaps develop better technical and tactical skill to be able to overcome some of the physical, physical limitations that they struggle with. So there are definitely on the one side some significant potential benefits to street sport. I mean, the benefits of street sport also need to be weighed up relative to some of the potential disadvantages with coach-led activity in the sense that research across many sports suggests that um, coaches are overly prescriptive in their manner of coaching uh, and that they, they structure coaching based on developing the performance of the athletes within that particular coaching session. So you quite often get coaches using you know, high levels of instruction, doing repetitive block practice of single skills with, with drill and grid-based practices being quite paramount, um, providing too much feedback to the athletes as part of the learning process. Um, so it's as much of a, the benefits of street sport as it is potentially some of the disadvantages with overly prescriptive approaches to coaching. And uh, of course, if you, if you kind of, it, it, and it's not necessarily a debate between street sport and coach and coach led instruction, of course, because there's no reason why a coach couldn't, for instance, lay on and oversee a session that resembles street sport. So it's more about the nature of the activity as much as anything in the sense that, whether it's street sport or whether it's a coach-led session, there is an onus or it helps the athlete if they're engaging in activity that requires them to be dynamic, creative, and adaptive, and to explore the wide range of variability that exists when kids perform sports skills in different kinds of contexts and environments. So you, you briefly just mentioned repetitive block practice. Can you describe yeah. what that is and how, how that differs from like a, a realistic um, practice drill that actually mimics performance in the game? Yes. I mean, we could take an example like tennis, for instance. So repetitive block practice might be a scenario where the tennis player is asked to play forearm drive shots from one particular point on his or her side of the court to a targets on the other side of the court, for instance. And that repetitive block practice may even be accompanied by the use of a ball projection machine. So, you know, the notion is then is that if you continue to repeat and practice the skill in the same way, that to some degree, that skill will become grooved. and You'll be able to continuously repeat that in the match situation. But, of course, the reality of it is, uh, is that research evidence has shown us that there's a lot of variability in the manner in which athletes perform these types of skills. Uh, so that, uh, you know, even if you're playing the forehand drive to the same spot on the court, you will probably might do so with topspin, with backspin, with different ball velocities. 
And and often, of course, uh, you know, you don't play repetitive shots, but a shot, one type of shot is often followed by another type of shot. So you go forehand drive, backhand drive, forehand volley, and so on and so forth. And whilst these repetitive blocked practice conditions appear better for short-term performance in practice, the evidence suggests that the more variability we create in the practice environment, then the better that these skills are retained and transferred to the competitive situation. And I guess that might also be in part some of the benefits of street sport in that, you know, because kids create these realistic uh, match-like scenarios, there is a lot more variability inherent in those types of practice activities, particularly where, in contrast, the alternative is to work with a coach who's overly prescriptive in his or her approach to coaching, which creates that repetitive drill type scenario. Do you think this this style of play, which is like informal play, street sports, uh, do you think that's being overlooked in this day and age with so much emphasis on organized sports and so much emphasis on specialization and, and making sure the kid gets the best chances at, at becoming elite? Uh, parents often right away think, okay, I got to specialize the kid in order for him to make it. So do you think street sports has also kind of been overlooked? Certainly the the evidence would suggest that there's been a significant cultural change. And I guess if if people of of my generation and older will recall that, you know, we didn't have access to PlayStations and head-mounted VR displays at that particular age. And, And ultimately... You know, we had to occupy ourselves. So in those days, you did play a lot of street sport if you were interested in sport, because that's how you used to fill your time. Whereas these days, I guess there are alternative things for children to do to entertain themselves. Uh, there's also, of course, greater access to access to television as well these days compared to uh, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, so that's reduced the the hours that children are spending in street sport at uh, at the same time as well of course there are increasing concerns over um, child welfare and safety and the potential issues around kids going out to play uh, even in local environments on their own uh, arguably there could be a decline in the amount of spaces that we have available for this type of street sport to take place you know many communities actually ban ball games in streets these days which makes it quite quite difficult for these kids to to take part um and of course i think there is a tendency either that that also that a lot of these activities have become very very structured so i think as you're inclined there you know we've moved towards a culture where where everything is done in discrete blocks so the kids might have soccer practice five to six you know, homework six to seven, baseball practice seven to eight, and everything's become very, very structured and repetitive in nature. And maybe also there's become an increasing focus on coach education, and and that coach education has fueled even more structure in regards to the nature of the activities in which these kids take taking part in. Uh, and we have to be careful here as well because I'm not trying to imply that. Um, uh, coaches don't have a crucial role to play here. They do. The role, the role of the coach isn't becoming redundant. I'm certainly not advocating that by any stretch of the imagination. But, uh, you know, the challenge is for the coach to create realistic practice situations that better reflect and mimic the demands of match play and competition. Now, that doesn't simply mean throwing them the ball and allowing them, you know, to play Uh, street sport in that particular environment and to some degree actually uh, coaching through let's say a more constraints based perspective is much more difficult uh, as opposed to following you know the the 100 best drills for developing passing skills in soccer because you have to understand the sport fully and you have to understand what changes when you might manipulate different constraints, for instance, like the size of the playing area, uh, the number of players involved in the scenario, the different conditions that you might put on play in the sense, for instance, the child could only have two touches. Uh, 
So all these things shape behaviors, but they don't shape behaviors randomly. They kind of shape or are intended to shape behavior in a way that the coach acts as a catalyst or a facilitator, uh, shaping, molding the learning environment, which in turn shapes and molds the nature of the skills that the athlete develops. So it's very different to traditional prescriptive types, types of coaching sessions involving uh, drills and grids, but it's also different to the street sport environment, which, which you know, there's really no structure in at all. So it's finding that right balance in, uh, in being hands-on and hands-off that is probably one of the most difficult challenges for coaches across a variety of different sports. What about creativity? Has there been any research on whether street sports promote creativity more than normal structured practices that are coach led? Or is that kind of just, you know, a hypothesis that we have that's like a byproduct of street sports? Mm -hmm. There is published research to suggest that those who have superior, what might be called game intelligence skills, like anticipation and decision making, Uh, typically accumulate more hours in street sport-related activity during development. Um, so, and that, that there are at least off the top of my head half a dozen studies that have looked at that particular issue, um, certainly in soccer and also in cricket. Um, creativity is very difficult to define, actually, in the sense of, you know, what is creativity? How do you measure creativity? Um, and it's very difficult. And um, some of the published work that has looked at creativity, uh, I'm not sure they've always looked at creativity. I think some of them have looked at anticipation and decision-making, but I think there's more to creativity than anticipation and decision-making. So, um, and people, uh, Daniel Memmer from Cologne has probably done more work than anybody in creativity, but... Um, And I've read quite a few of Daniel's papers, which obviously make a very nice contribution to the field. But I think there are still challenges around defining what we actually mean by creativity, and even more so perhaps in terms of how we measure creativity. But certainly, if you might argue that there might be links, for instance, between game intelligence and creativity, which I suspect there probably is, then certainly there is evidence to suggest that um, engagement in street sport is beneficial for the development of the perceptual cognitive skills that underpin anticipation and decision making. No, you're, you're absolutely right. The creativity is very hard to kind of define and also measure. Um, but the reason I was asking is, and you mentioned this in the book too, uh, players that I grew up watching and loved watching as a kid, like Ronaldinho, Rubinho, um, and those guys, they were I guess, you know, it's hard to define, but when you watch them, it's easy to tell that these are some of the most creative players that have ever played soccer. Um, a lot of them grew up playing street soccer or futsal. And you mentioned mm -hmm. in the book the role of that on, on kind of uh, on creativity, but also on decision-making and anticipation. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think, yeah, when I heard that on the audiobook, that kind of brought me back to, to being a kid watching those guys on TV. Mm -hmm. No, no, absolutely. And again, I can come back to a couple of phrases that are used in the literature sometimes. You know, researchers talk about routine ex expertise and adaptive expertise. And um, it may well be that um, uh, traditional approaches to coaching are very good at developing routine expertise. So routine experts to those who can solve most problems most of the time. And I guess when coaches explicitly coach decision making, And develop some of that um, explicit knowledge that underpins that process, then maybe that's what, in essence, what they're developing, this concept of routine expertise. But adaptive expertise, this notion that experts can solve all problems, be creative and adaptable in manner, might be best developed through different types of exposure and coaching. Um, you can easily see how the continuous problem-solving situations that are created by street sport may well provide the best environment for, for the development of those kinds of skills. This uh, opportunity to explore potential solutions, you know, not just from a tactical perspective, but also, of course, from a technical perspective. You know, what can I do with the ball? How can I shape ball trajectory using different parts of the foot 
for instance, in order to make the ball go from point A to point B. These things can be shaped by instruction, but require probably a fair amount of exploration and discovery to mm -hmm. ascertain what can be done and what can't be done and so on and so forth. So speaking of the structure of sports, early specialization is always a hot topic in sports because the evidence on it is kind of mixed. Um, some say it's beneficial, some say it's harmful, some say it's neutral, um, some say it leads to injuries and burnout, some say it doesn't. Um, what role does early specialization play in elite expertise attainment and what do we know so far about this effect? Yeah, I think we end that particular chapter in the book uh, arguing for the relative plus and minuses of the terms you've used there. I think we end it with a comment, it depends. And I think it really does. There are so many factors that impact whether there is a need to some degree to specialize or engage early or whether it's to follow, it's best to follow a diversification pathway. I mean, clearly there are some potential disadvantages that you're alluding to there with early specialization, that there's some evidence to suggest that there is an increased risk of burnout, overuse injuries and potential dropout. Um, but then there are a lot of sports that are culturally immensely popular. And uh, where early engagement in those sports is definitely the norm, you know, in a, in a, a ski, a strong ski town like Park City, Utah, then it's common that kids are on the slopes at two, three years of age and they're getting formal instruction at age five and they're actually competing at age seven in, uh, you know, in parts of Brazil or in uh, the inner, inner city Liverpool, then kids start playing soccer at around four years of age and are in competitive leagues by six, six and often in elite training academies by six, seven, eight years of age. So in those sports, um, early engagement, I'm going to use the term early engagement here rather than specialization is the norm. So what I mean by early engagement is that they're spending most time in one sport probably because it's the sport that they have most passion and interest for. But it doesn't mean that they're not sampling other sports to some degree. Uh, you know, so <clears throat> even in the book, for instance, we've got some illustration. Marcus Rashford said that, you know, he was playing soccer at four or five years of age. Soccer was his big, big passion. But also he played cricket, he played rugby, he played different other sports at school. But nowhere near to the extent that he was participating in soccer per se. So we've defined that as early engagement as opposed to early specialization. And of course, one of the issues here, even when you mention specialization, well, you know, we don't have a clear definition of what specialization is. Uh, if I participate mostly in soccer and spend an hour a week playing uh, golf and tennis, is that a diversification pathway or a specialization? And how is that different if I, if I mainly play soccer but play half a dozen other sports for half an hour a week. So we don't even know what diversification and specialization are in the sense we don't have clear definitions of them. But certainly there are sports, um, soccer being one, skiing being another, where there are certainly some advantages to be gained by early engagement in those particular sports. There are other sports where early specialization is certainly the norm. I can think of sports like gymnastics here, for instance, where even by age 18, these kids have often accumulated approaching 20,000 hours in practice. So these are sports, I guess, where you typically reach an elite level fairly early in development. I mean, there are other sports, often sports that are less culturally popular, where late specialization is the norm. Uh, you know, we talk in the book, for instance, about Helen Glover, who's um, uh, an Olympic champion in rowing, and she didn't start rowing until her early 20s. Um, so, you know, ultimately, rowing is not a sport that is heavily dependent on, say, technical and tactical skills. It's not a sport that is immensely popular globally, such that early engagement 
or early specialization is the norm. So in those types of sports, there's evidence to suggest that you can specialize late. So ultimately, it really does depend. And perhaps um, the, the choice and interests of the child should be paramount here in the sense that, um, you know, if the child wants to participate in a great variety of different sports, then great. We'd support, I'd support the child in that regard. If the child believes that he or she has found their one true love at a very early age and wants to spend all their time playing that sport, then, uh, you know, that's, that's also okay. I mean, clearly we have to be aware of issues around burnout and overuse, but um, sometimes, you know, we should maybe allow the child to follow their own interests and their passion and either take that sampling approach or, or take a more specialized approach to the process i mean ultimately the the argument that has been put forward of course over the potential disadvantages of a late specialization approach is the concept that you may end up with a practice deficit compared to children who specialize earlier in that age and in that sport and um you know, that may well be the case in certain sports. If you take a scenario, for instance, where you have a child that is brought up in a soccer mad city like Manchester or Liverpool, who starts engaging the sport very early, four, five, six years of age, joins the academy environment. And maybe by the age of nine, that child has accumulated perhaps three to 4,000 hours of practice activities in the sport. Whereas you may have a child in a rural part of the US participates in a wide variety of sports like soccer but also participates in baseball basketball soccer and then by age nine has accumulated let's say a thousand hours of practice hours in soccer now in a sport that's heavily dependent on technical and tactical ability can you make up for that two thousand hour two to three thousand hour practice deficit that you have at nine years of age it's, it's, it's very very difficult i should also say of course that there are some sports that um, uh, show both types of engagement. If you take a sport like rugby, for instance, what you find is that um, players in the more technical positions like fly half and scrum half tend to specialise around eight years of age, whereas the players who play in the second row, who are usually six foot six plus and you know, 20 odd stone, uh, they specialize much later, as around 13 and 14 years of age. So even within certain sports, you have some differences in age of specialization, which probably reflects the physical stroke, technical, tactical demands of those different roles. So it's really hard to kind of make it a one-size-fits-all approach, even though I feel like a lot of people try to make it that way. Um, when it comes to early specializations, like should you specialize or should you sample? But it comes down to so many variables, what the athlete themselves prefer, what the parental resources are, you know, the technical and tactical skills and also the position itself. So I guess it's really yeah. hard to kind of pinpoint one answer to that question. Yes, very, very much. Although, you know, I am a strong supporter of the early engagement model because to some degree, that gives you the best of both worlds in that, you know, the sport that you're really most passionate and interested about, then you probably would want to spend more hours engaging in that than in other sports. But at the same time, I would never discourage that child. And I'd actively encourage them to sample other sports as well. Mm -hmm. So in that case, you know, you're getting the best of both worlds. So, um, yeah. so I think the problems are more evident with an early specialization or an early diversification approach in the sense that with the latter uh, early diversification, you may end up with a practice deficit. Whereas with a purely <coughs> early specialization approach, then you may end up with some issues around burnout, overuse, injuries, and dropout. So it's hard to talk about, um, you know, early engagement, early talent development without talking about talent identification and selection, because it's a necessary step in, in almost mm. any sports program, uh, whether that's youth, amateur sports, or even professional, like the draft, um, the way we have it here in North America. 
What are some of the biggest errors that scouts and coaches commit in talent evaluation and identification? Mm. Well, probably the single biggest error that scouts and coaches have traditionally made, of course, is to associate uh, physicality with performance within the sport, which has clearly led to a situation that... um, the highest proportion of athletes selected for participation in elite training programs are usually born in the first three months of the selection year. So the common mistake there is to associate being these, these kids being bigger and stronger uh, with talent in some way moving forward. Uh, and of course, rather paradoxically here, more recent research work has reported the so-called underdog effect in that whilst the majority of athletes selected for elite training programs are born in the first quarter of the selection year, a much higher proportion of athletes who are born in the final quarter of the selection year actually progress to elite status within the sport. And I believe there's some research from Canada that suggests that salaries in the NHL are negatively correlated with month of birth relative to the selection year. So I guess what that shows is that the younger born athletes or later born athletes, the younger athletes, um, they probably don't have the advantages of physical size early in development. And therefore, consequently, they have to focus on developing technical, tactical, psychological skills uh, in order to remain competitive against their, their larger compatriots. Uh, and then, of course, when a lot of these physical dif- differences dissipate post-puberty, then the later-born kids have the advantage of having uh, better game intelligence and um, technical skills, which seems to allow them to progress further within the sport. But it also makes you think about how many um, late birthday kids who were on their way maybe to develop those technical and tactical skills, but maybe they're a bit of a late bloomers and then they got weeded out of the system. And, you know, it makes you think about all that talent wastage that happens in in the sports systems as well. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, there is wastage of course, right across the spectrum. I mean, not only in terms of kids who, because they're disadvantaged physically early on that may drop out of sport, or maybe choose other sports moving away from from the, the sport that they're deselected from. Um, it's also a disadvantageous, of course, for the kids who are born with a physical advantage, because the question is, are we giving them the right learning environment to then develop these technical and tactical skills that are likely to be important later in development? So they're able to get away with the fact that they're physically bigger and stronger than their competitors, uh, and therefore, they're also disadvantaged. So I think there's disadvantage at both ends of the spectrum here. Um, you know, whether you're um, uh, born early or late in the selection here, there are clearly disadvantages. So I guess the challenge is to try and get as many kids involved in, this, in any sport as early as possible to try and keep them engaged for as long as possible. And um, I mean, there are dramatic challenges with with talent identification. Um, you know, it, probably its efficacy does depend to a great deal on the nature and type of sport involved. But um, we we still search for some clear and reliable identificate identificators of talent, and uh, it may well be that um, you know that's that will be a long journey and that progress is going to be quite slow on the issue. Yeah. No, that's an interesting point about the the bigger the bigger kids who are more physical also being disadvantaged in some way. I think I feel like that's an overlooked aspect because we often look at them when they're, you know, youth athletes and we go they're good. Like they they got let's focus on the on the smaller ones. But over the long term, the bigger ones may be disadvantaged because they're getting by based like yeah. only based on their size and then when other kids might catch up in size or maybe the level of competition goes up what's going to happen to them how have we given yeah. them enough opportunities to develop those skills so yeah. that's, that's very interesting yep. to think about yeah um speaking of keeping kids in or athletes in in sports as long as possible um one thing you mentioned in the book is talent transfer where mm-hmm. maybe uh 
an athlete goes from one sport to another. Um, and yep. that's been an, an area of interest of mine for a while. Uh, what's the extent of our knowledge on talent transfer as of now? Like, have we been able to pinpoint which sports allow for easier transfer skills or? Not really. I mean, the, uh, the empirical evidence around transfer is comparatively weak. I mean, there's a lot of intuitive anecdotal evidence Uh, to support the notion that transfer may occur. And, and even in the book, there are some illustrations of um, some top athletes implying that uh, there was some transfer, like uh, Ibrahimovic, the, the soccer player, argues that his engagement in Taekwondo during development has helped him you know, perform overhead kicks in soccer, for instance. And Djokovic, the tennis player, argues that his time spent on the ski Uh, slopes helps him to slide around the court but you know to some degree that's all intuitive and anecdotal there's no empirical evidence to that the theory suggests of course that transfer is more likely when two tasks share common elements or processes and it's probably easier to envisage that there might be transfer for instance between soccer and futsal than there might be between skiing and rugby, for instance, you know, because obviously the, the former two uh, seem to have a lot more similar processes and elements. There is some empirical evidence to suggest that um, perceptual cognitive skills might transfer across sports. Uh, we certainly published some work um, about 15 odd years ago that uh, identified that pattern recognition skills might transfer from soccer to field hockey and vice versa, but not between those two sports in volleyball. And there is some evidence to suggest that there is lower level transfer of physiological attributes uh, and also of technical abilities. But the evidence overall is quite flimsy. And the evidence that substantiates the the importance of specificity in training is much, much stronger than the evidence around transferability of skill. And um, I also wonder whether, I mean, in the book, for instance, Chelsea War, who was the high performance director at UK Sport, talks a lot about the, uh, the talent transfer programs that GP Sport used uh, as part of their Olympic programs over the last few Olympic cycles. Uh, but when you, when you read the material in depth, you see that she's talking more about talent trans, sorry, yeah, talent um, uh, recycling more than talent transfer per se, because what, what they actually did is they, for instance, uh, looked at the population of athletes who are tried to become professional soccer players, not quite made the grade, And these were generally a population of, you know, quite gifted athletes in many, many ways. And then what they've done, of course, is they've then recycled those athletes into a sport that is less popular. And that clearly, clearly they would then up near the top end of that particular population group in terms of their physical and physiological attributes. But that, that would be more of an example of talent recycling rather than talent transfer. Per se. Uh, and in fact, <coughs> if you look at the medals that Team GB has won over the last couple of Olympics, it was, it was less than 10% of them that actually came from that talent recycling program in any case. Most of the athletes that achieved Olympic medals were actually already in the system. And it was probably more to do with the uh, high quality training, access to sports science, and Uh, high quality coaching that would have increased their chances of success rather than the talent transfer component. You mentioned just briefly um, maybe the transfer of perceptual cognitive skills. Um, do you mind explaining what perceptual cognitive skills are and how can they be developed? The perceptual cognitive skill that I was referring to earlier on in talking about transfer between field hockey and soccer and vice versa, relates to this concept of pattern recognition, the fact that experts can recognize structure and familiarity that links 
individual players into meaningful offensive and defensive structures. And that's an important perceptual cognitive skill that has been demonstrated across a range of different team sports. I mean, there are a range of other perceptual cognitive skills that have been identified in the literature as well, such as the ability of athletes to recognize information from the postural orientation or body shape of an opponent that then allows them to anticipate what the opponent will do before ball racket contact, ball release, or football contact. Um, there's also evidence that suggests experts develop um, more accurate expectations of what will likely happen in any given situation, um, uh, you know, based on their previous exposure to those types of situations. And there's also quite a lot of research work that suggests that experts use the visual system in a much more efficient and effective manner to pick up and process information in the display. So the argument is, is that these perceptual cognitive skills are developed through extensive exposure within the specific sport. Now, although, as I illustrated earlier, it may be possible that some of these skills might transfer to a degree across sports. Um, these skills are fundamental to uh, game intelligence skills like anticipation and decision making. Uh, we know that these skills are developed effectively through engagement in street sport, as I suggested earlier on, and that clearly uh, the right type of practice opportunity supported by the right type of coaching would uh, help develop these skills as well. And Recently, there's increasing evidence to suggest that simulation training, uh, where either using video or virtual reality or computer animation in various guises, um, can also be used to recreate realistic match situations that may also provide a platform to help develop these types of game intelligence skills. Uh, and we obviously know that these kind of game intelligence skills are crucial at the highest levels of performance, particularly in fast ball sports and team ball sports or team games. Yeah, you, you mentioned uh, anticipation and uh, decision-making, and that's so important in sport performance. What about reaction time? Is that, um, because what I'm starting to see is a lot of, a lot of uh, companies, they claim to be sports science companies, they train athletes on reaction time using lights and other methods where, you know, a light flash and you, life flashes and you have to tap it right away and the claim is that it translates over to sport performance um how much stock do you put in that kind of stuff not not a huge amount i mean in the literature we differentiate between uh, domain generic measures of cognitive function and this domain specific measures of cognitive function so domain generic measures would be measures like reaction time working memory capacity, et cetera. And, and even potentially variables like visual acuity, depth perception, peripheral vision. And the evidence suggests that these domain uh, specific measures, sorry, domain generic measures are not good predictors of performance in the task or of expertise. Whereas domain specific measures like uh, the ability to pick up postural cues, this pattern recognition and the use of situational probabilities do seem to be very strong predictors of expertise. I mean, to some degree, it becomes a very simple question. If the task looks like the sport uh, and uses sport-specific stimuli, then it's most likely to discriminate and it's more likely to have a training benefit. But if the sport doesn't look like the sport, and is training some of these more generic skills or attributes, then it's unlikely to actually transfer. So in this regard, again, the concept of specificity uh, is quite important in determining the value and transferability of the types of practice that the athletes are engaging in. Yeah, I mean, we, we see uh, athletes engage in all sorts of training that looks like nothing, like the actual mm. sports. And they pay quite a bit of money for those resources. Uh, they're all private companies, private trainers with expensive equipment. And it kind of makes me think what a shame that they're spending, you know, the money and the time could be spent elsewhere. That's uh, 
Yeah, I, absolutely. I, I, w- I would agree in that regard. And there's there's almost a very simple litmus test that applies here, actually, in the sense that, you know, if ever you're watching a practice session in any sport, then maybe the question to be asked is to what extent does that practice session look like the sport or the game uh, in the sense that it's um, pushing athletes to use the same kind of tactical and technical skills and even to some degree that the physical and uh, uh, sort of psychological aspects of training match that. So clearly we typically perform in sport when we fatigue, when we're stressed, when we're emotional. Um, and the practice environment needs to better mimic the actual comp- competitive environment to ensure that there is a higher degree of transfer. And in essence, that we get increased efficiency from, or a greater return from every hour that we spend in practice. The more it matches and looks like competition, the more likely it is that that transfer will occur. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Williams, thank you so much again for your time. Um, I really enjoyed our conversation. And obviously, we had limited time today, so we didn't get to everything you discuss in the book. So can you tell us where people can find the book and what else is in the book that uh, we didn't get to today that maybe people can learn more about? Yeah, most of our discussion today focused on the first part, as you suggested, where we look at uh, the role of luck and serendipity and environmental factors in becoming an elite athlete. In the middle section of the book, we shift towards talking about some of the adaptations that occur as a result of prolonged engagement in the sport. So we've spoken a little bit about game intelligence, uh, and there are at least a couple of chapters that focus on highlighting some of these key perceptual cognitive adaptations that occur. There's also a chapter on uh, the art of the con, which is about disguise and deception in sport. Um, There are chapters on the psychological characteristics of greatness. How do we avoid choking? Uh, What are the characteristics that uh, determine team expertise? And uh, how do we overcome a penalty shootout? (laughs) Um, so we review the literature and highlight the fact that you know a key component of expertise is the fact that as humans we demonstrate considerable plasticity and adaptability and we change as a function of the practice constraints that are placed upon us and make those kinds of adaptations that are crucial to performance and then in the final section of the book we shift a little bit to focus more specifically on practice. We talk about deliberate practice. What is is what is it and how can you implement it into your training programs? We talk about the, the key role of the coach and what science tells us about um, designing effective practice sessions with the strong argument being there that um, there may be some uh, strong advantages to using less prescriptive Uh, more hands-off approaches to instruction than has traditionally been the case, thereby empowering the learner to take more control over his or her learning environment. Uh, So we've got some interviews, again, from some very prominent coaches there about how they've changed their philosophy and their approach to coaching and instruction over recent years. And then we close with a forward-looking chapter that looks at the role of technology in the development of elite athletes. So we visit Barcelona Football Club to uh, look at some of the approaches they're using to integrate sports science into high-performance sport. And we talk about um, the importance of sleep, uh, neuroscience, nutrition, and virtual reality in, uh, in developing elite athletes and how the role of technology is playing a much bigger part in the um, day-to-day training of elite athletes and how it will continue to impact on this process moving forward. I mean, if you visited Real Madrid, it might have been a better chapter, but I agree that the book in general (laughs) is fascinating (laughs) Um, and has a great content. So people can buy it from Amazon. They can get it from uh, book retailers as well. Um, Yes, it's at Waterstones, Barnes & Noble in North America. Um, We may be having some stock issues at the moment as a function of COVID, but uh, Amazon generally is the best best place to um, 
access to book. Uh, certainly no issues with stock in terms of the Kindle and audio version of the books, but um, as I guess most people across the globe, COVID is having an impact on the publishing and distribution of books globally, but certainly Amazon would be the first point of call.